It's beautiful, isn't it? The Will Turn Theater in Los Angeles, one of America's picture palaces, built in 1931 and reopened 54 years later in May of 1985. Hi, I'm Gene Kelly, and I want you to come with me back to a time when where we went to the movies was as important as the movies we went to see. It all began here in the early days of the century in arcades where we looked through tiny windows onto a special world. What we saw transported us to other worlds, pictures that moved, lived, and we traveled outward to the stars, or inward to all those hidden places where we keep our own dreams. What we saw was unbelievable, amazing, strange, and exciting. It made us laugh and cry. It helped us celebrate the good times and forget the bad times. This was the magic of the movies. And every day, more and more people came to see this eighth wonder of the world. But take a look at where we went to the movies in those very early days. Narrow, small rooms called Nickelodeons, because that's what it costs to get in, a nickel. A screen at one end, a projection and ticket booth at the other end. Bare walls and very uncomfortable seats. Something like the movie theaters of today. But even nickels add up. By 1917, Charlie Chaplin was making a million dollars a year. The movies were becoming big business. And so the builders and the architects, men with a dream, with vision, began to build larger and grander theaters that by 1920 would bring millions of people to the movies. And studio heads like William Fox and Marcus Lowe, who helped pay for the early picture palaces, built even more extravagant theaters, trying to outdo each other in magnificent excess. These early theaters became in themselves major cultural events in both large and small cities. Everybody had to go to the movies to see the newest theater. The men who built these great theaters were themselves showmen. Sid Grauman, Balaban and Katz, William Fox, Roxy Rothwell, and as the movies got bigger and more spectacular, the theaters rivaled them in size and imagination. These theaters were, in scale and luxury, a fantasy come true. Many of them equaled the ornate and beautiful opera houses and concert halls of the 19th century. Actually, some of these early picture palaces were imitations of great European theaters, like the Paris Opera House. In 1919, New York proudly revealed the 5,000-seat capital, and in the decade between 1920 and 1930, more than 250 major movie theaters opened their doors to a public that just couldn't get enough of the movies. By 1930, 90 million Americans were going to the movies every week. Do you know what it used to cost to sit in a large, beautiful place like this for an afternoon or an evening just to watch movies? 65 cents. And for that 65 cents, you got not only a movie that you had waited weeks to see, you got music and live entertainment. From the moment we arrived to buy our tickets, there was a sense of something special, a feeling that it was an event, that once we stepped inside these picture palaces, we would be entering another world. A famous theater owner, Marcus Lowe, said, we sell tickets to theaters, not movies. The marquees excited our sense of anticipation. The 
ticket booths, even the tickets themselves. The ushers, they were all like attendants at the court of some fabulous legendary king. We waited for the show to begin in great spacious areas surrounded by golden statues, flickering lamps, and gilded decorations. Ornate ceilings look down on us from incredible heights like the great cathedrals of Europe we'd only seen in pictures. We were, all at once, in ancient Egypt, in a Chinese palace, a Mayan temple, in a Persian garden, or in an underwater grotto. When it was time for the show to begin, we walked up wide staircases, holding on to the carved or gilded banisters which would have pleased the crowned heads of Europe. And when, finally, we entered the theater itself, we were already changed. We had left behind the everyday world, and we were ready for that special magic that was the movies. And the movies didn't just start. The lights dimmed. And in many of those wonderful theaters, the mighty Wurlitzer organ began to rise out of the darkness. Gaylord Carter began playing the organ in theaters in the 1920s and has been entertaining audiences for over 60 years. The great movie palaces of the old days were, it was like going into a cathedral. The, the million dollar theater there at Third and Broadway was, it was like entering a great temple. But what was going on in there was pretty important too. Now, for instance, the, when I first went there in 1926, the feature picture was The Temptress with Greta Garbo. There was a 30-piece symphony orchestra in the pit playing the score of the picture and the overture. And then they would play the first 10 minutes of the last show at night, and I would finish the evening out with the rest of it. On the stage was Paul Whiteman with his marvelous jazz band, jazz orchestra, introducing the Rhapsody in Blue. There was a newsreel, a cartoon, and my organ solo was Roses of Picardy. I haven't played it since, and I don't know how I happened to play it then, but you got all of this for 35 cents if you got in before 6 p.m. The theater organ was developed so that when the organ came on and the orchestra went to take their uh, rest, it didn't drop down and, uh, and seem like you'd suddenly gone into a mortuary. What they did was increase the pressures in the pipes and uh, give it a more vibrant sound. Then they added the traps and the percussions, tambourines and the, the, the bells and the xylophones and the drums to make it, uh, to, to give it this orchestral effect. Now, uh, I have this organ rigged up for that kind of thing, and here is some of the sound using these uh, percussions and, um, and uh, what we call the uh, 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 toy counter, which is the drums and tambourines and things. So that would be this. <laughs> for the silent pictures had a very special kind of sound. For instance, a love scene sounded very, very much like this. Now, the name of that is Hearts and Flowers, and it was a famous, famous piece. In fact, uh, it sort of identified itself with the early, early days of the, of the silent movies. Now, the next important ingredient and something that is, is in all movies, whether silent or sound, is the big chase. And that goes kind of like this. <laughs> Now, I can go on like that indefinitely because some of these chases lasted 10 minutes. 
I remember one time, probably in about 1928, we were uh, having a premiere of uh, Tell It to the Marines with uh, Lon Chaney. And uh, the manager said, you're going to have to play for about an hour while the people are coming in. So he says, don't play the Marines hymn and marches and things furiously for that whole time. He said, I would appreciate it if you would just perfume the air with music. And I think that's a beautiful expression, and I've been trying to perfume the air ever since. But there are times when you have to get up and roar and make a big sound. And it's nice to have a balance between the perfume and the fury. In addition to organ music, there were elaborate stage shows that became as famous as any in the world, like the Rockettes at Radio City Music Hall in New York. In the sound of their dancing feet, we heard echoes of other extravagant and fantastic stage spectacles that one could see at the Roxy Theater in New York, or the Fox Theater in St. Louis. But by the 1930s, it was the movie stars who drew Americans to the picture palaces. Often, the movies weren't very good. At times, they were terrible. But no one seemed to care. No one read reviews, and you couldn't wait to see it on television, because there was no television. So we all went to the movies, young and old, rich and poor, once, twice, three times a week. We sat in these darkened theaters, and we lived in the world of our imagination. You live. You must live. Perhaps it's better if I live in your heart. When you said she could dance, one of the best. All right. Hold it! Hold it! Hold it! Let's see what you can do. In neighborhood theaters or in downtown picture palaces, whether it was a regular show or a star-studded premiere, the fans turned out to worship their favorites. The stars, the music, and the sense of spectacle needed an appropriate setting. The Hollywood studios provided the money. Architects like Thomas Lamb more than matched the showman's vision with larger and larger scale and greater and greater opulence. Lamb's masterpiece was the San Francisco Fox, now destroyed. Among the survivors of the Low State in Syracuse, the Ohio in Columbus, and the Lowe's 175th Street, one of five so-called wonder theaters built for impresario Marcus Lowe in New York at the end of the 1920s. Lamb believed that exotic ornaments and colors create an atmosphere in which the mind is free to frolic and becomes receptive to entertainment. Theaters became even more extravagant during the wild boom of the 1920s. There was authentic Chinese. The auditorium of Seattle's Fifth Avenue was an almost perfect duplicate of the throne room of the Imperial Palace in Peking, but at twice the original scale. Sid Grauman's Chinese in Hollywood could best be described as Chinese Chippendale. Nearby was his Egyptian theater, the first of Grauman's Hollywood exotics. Other exotic motifs included Gothic, Baroque, Siamese Byzantine, Mayan, and American Indian. Decorators brought antique furniture, statuary, even a safari room from Africa to fill their movie theaters. Lamb's chief rival was the firm of Rapp and Rapp, whose palaces included several of Chicago's finest, the Chicago, the Uptown, and the Southtown. In New York, the Paramount in Times Square and Lowe's Kings in Brooklyn. George Rapp, in calling these picture palaces a shrine to democracy, said this by way of explanation. Watch the eyes of a child as it treads the pathway to fairyland. Watch the light in the eyes of a tired shop girl as she walks amid the furnishings that once delighted the hearts of queens. See the toil-worn father as he finds strength 
and rest. There you have the answer to why motion picture theaters are so palatial. As costs rose, so did the popularity of the atmospherics, like San Antonio's Majestic. The architect, John Eberson, specialized in creating theaters where a star-studded plaster sky looked down on a Persian or Renaissance garden. Elaborate lighting machines projected clouds and sunrises and sunsets. In each, the magic was achieved for much less than the cathedrals of marble and gilt. Eberson's greatest theaters, Chicago's Paradise and the Paradise in the Bronx, are gone or changed beyond recognition. But others remain. Miami's Olympia lives now as the Gusman Center for the Performing Arts, and in Akron, Ohio, there is the beautiful Lowe's Akron. Eberson was not the only one to use the stars in Cloud's design. The firm of Plunkett and Edwards created an elegant Spanish mission-style atmospheric, the Arlington in Santa Barbara, California. One of the most impressive and beautiful of all the atmospherics is the Atlanta Fox, designed for movie mogul William Fox to out Baghdad Baghdad. Both interior and exterior provide an exotic setting for the Arabian Nights. Throughout the 1920s, architects sought inspiration from the past. As late as 1931, architect S. Charles Lee, who designed over 400 theaters, used French Baroque for his Versailles-inspired Los Angeles theater. Listen to Charles Lee as he remembers the picture palaces. One of the things that we have to decide when we're building a theater is how to get the maximum entertainment value for the customer comes up to the box office, he pays his money, and he wants to go into another world. When they stepped into the foyer, they were overwhelmed by the beauty. This theory of the entertainment was built into every facet of the theater. Even the exit signs were attractive. We gave them a feeling of inner security and inner beauty. You must remember that the majority of the patrons of the theater of that day were working people, and they did not have the opportunity of seeing these beautiful things. So each and every detail, the columns, the lunettes, the balconies, the fountains, the stairways, were something that they did not have in their younger days, and it had a great effect on them. The philosophy of designing a theater of this type is one to create a feeling within the patron that he owns something very, very beautiful, that he's bought this with his 15 or 25 cents, and look what I've got. I can come in here, no king has got it any better. We went all out to try to find the type of architecture that would stimulate this kind of an effect in him. It was my intention that when they did come in here, that their mood would be one of entertainment, of complete abandon of the cares of the day. What have I done today should not enter their mind. I might have been fired, but when I walked in here and I saw everything that I had, I was in what we used to call the patron's heaven. It was a, an era and it was a feeling that will take a long time to duplicate. The movie palace went out dressed in the height of fashion, moving from the jazz age to the streamlined elegance of the 1930s. Some of the finest theaters were built in those last few years, between 1928 and 1932. Here, in the Avalon on Catalina Island, we imagined we were in an underwater grotto surrounded by the mystery of the sea. The Oakland Paramount is an anthology of Art Deco style, from the vast mosaic facade to the intimate lounge areas.
from the rainbow lighting effects behind metal grills to the Inca treasury of the auditorium with its incised gold walls. The last and the grandest of all is Radio City Music Hall. Built in 1932, with its glittering lobby, towering ceilings, and its 6,000-seat auditorium. Legend has it that Roxy Rothafel himself sketched the great golden arches in memory of a sunset he had seen from an ocean liner. The Great Depression that had begun in 1929 and lingered until the mid-1930s was the requiem of the American Picture Palace. Not only did it end the building of such ornate movie theaters, but it emptied existing theaters and bankrupted the companies that owned them. Only a few years after they had opened, many palaces had to close their doors. The end of the Depression helped a little. Business picked up slowly, but it was World War II that gave movie palaces their last hurrah. Gas rationing, a spirit of camaraderie, the lure of the newsreel in a pre-television age pulled in the crowds day and night. In the 1950s, the movie boom went bust. The studios were compelled by antitrust legislation to sell off their theaters. The coming of television and the middle-class flight to the suburbs hurt movie going in general, but hardest hit were the downtown palaces. Treasures were auctioned off. Theaters were torn down or carved up, or simply reduced to rubble. A few lingered on, but only as shadows of their former splendor. Some survived by showing action movies at bargain prices. Vandalism was rife. Owners could scarcely afford heating bills, much less a platoon of uniformed ushers. Surrounded by the ruins of New York's Roxy, Gloria Swanson says farewell to the picture palace she had launched a mere 30 years before. Then when all seemed lost, new uses were found for the picture palaces. They were transformed into theaters, symphony halls, and centers for the performing arts. Recycled as churches and sporting arenas, and all at a fraction of the cost of new construction. Citizens groups and individuals rallied to save theaters like the Atlanta Fox, the Oakland Paramount, and the Columbus, Ohio, on the very eve of its destruction. Mary Bishop, who helped save the Ohio, remembers the struggle and the victory. There were other people who became involved in it. We began to look more closely at it. All we knew in the beginning was that the building was sound structurally, that it had good acoustics, it had a marvelous location right across the street from the uh, Capitol Estate, and Columbus needed a performing arts center. That's really why we began the movement to save this theater. As beautiful as these theaters are, they do not serve the performing arts well without a great deal of alteration. Malcolm Holtzman was the architect who designed the restoration of the Ohio Theater. The Ohio has been in the process of being restored for 10 years. The building is being faithfully restored. Sometimes restoration is interpretive because you don't know how it was originally in appearance. That building was in relatively good shape. It was only dirty. In fact, very minor modifications had been made. The Lowy's company had good documents and photographs of the building, as did the people in Columbus. So it's just a sort of a detective process of finding out what was there and then putting it back. The Ohio Theater is a very interesting building for a number of reasons, in addition to the spectacular quality of the room inside. It sits downtown across the street from the state capitol. It has been named the State Theater of Ohio. And in fact, it has become the keystone of the redevelopment of that portion of downtown. Since the theater was saved, the arts have grown and flourished in Columbus as they had not before. We had over 400,000 people last year attending ballet, symphony, opera, all kinds of things. Well, I sometimes sit in the seats and look around and think I made a difference. Old films may fade from memory, 
but the great picture palaces that were their homes have been reborn. Across America, old palaces are bringing new vitality to the heart of our cities. They are priceless resources, both as architecture and as places of entertainment. The American picture palaces, they were both a reality and a fantasy. They were a part of our past and now are becoming once again a part of our present and our future. Today, almost 70 years after the birth of the American Picture Palace, we can again enjoy an acre of seats in a garden of dreams.